I can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. Communication. Hi, I'm Dick Flax. I'm a professor of sociology here at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And sitting around the table here are four other faculty from UCSB who, like I think millions of other people in the country, are struggling intellectually and emotionally with the results of the election. But each has, I think, um, some focused ideas about what might be important tools for thinking about or issues for thinking about uh, this election outcome. Uh, I think it's safe to say that um, although you might have bet on the incumbent president winning, uh, the amount of mobilization uh, against him uh, and support of, of uh, Senator Kerry was unprecedented. And so f many people were either surprised or perplexed or pleased by the outcome of the election ways that perhaps were unexpected. Let me introduce who's with us, uh, Professor Richard Applebaum, Univers uh, UCSB Department of Sociology, Director of the Institute for Social Behavioral and Economic Research here at uh, the University, uh, Professor Lisa Parks of our Film Studies program, uh, Professor Eileen Boris, uh, Women's Studies, actually uh, has a distinguished chair, the whole professorship of Women's Studies, and Professor Chris Newfield of the University of California, Santa Barbara English Department. So it's a varied <laughs> disciplinary group. Um, and uh, we got together, I think, because we each uh, had some thoughts that we were sharing on email, and now's the time to share it with, uh, with, with you. Uh, let's let's uh, ask Eileen, perhaps, to talk first about um, uh, how you saw the, the outcome of the election or what you, and, and your reactions to it, uh, things that you think people need to really take into account or think about as a result of it. Okay. I want to make two points, and I'm, with one of my points I'm going to put on my historian's hat, and with my other point will be uh, what you might expect a women's studies professor to say. So I'll say that, so I'll say the first uh, of uh, what a women's studies professor might say. And that is that, yes, uh, there was a gender gap. Yes, the gender gap was slightly less. And to just to remind people, the gender gap is the difference between the percentage women and the percentage men voting for the winning candidate. That's how it's often um, measured. And in the 2000 election, it was about 10%. His, since 1980, when it emerged, when Reagan uh, was slashing social programs for the first time uh, and linking the fortunes of the Republican Party to what then was called the New Right, the so-called moral majority, uh, it, it's been 7.7% since uh, 1980. Uh, this year it was 7%. But I think it's important that not all women are the same. That we have to divide, look, we have to look at the differences among women to understand uh, who voted for Bush, who voted for Kerry, and that this generalized notion of women is an inadequate uh, concept. We saw that married women with children, who previously had been dubbed soccer moms, uh, being concerned with work and family issues, quality of daily life issues, uh, had become security moms, but security defined in a very narrow way. And I want to get back to that in just one second. So Bush won 59% of the married women with children uh, under 18 vote. 
but when you look at the not married, which would include people who aren't allowed to get married because of their sexual preference, uh, as well as people who voluntarily decide not to engage in that institution, uh, Kerry uh, won 58% of those uh, votes. Among feminists, Kerry won 64%. The, but Kerry's most significant group of voters were non-white women. I think these are very significant, uh, that race is the major fault line in American society still, and it certainly played that way out in the election. Now, why? Why is it that non-white women, unmarried people, men and women, union members, single women, rejected Bush by massive numbers. And the issue of reproductive rights certainly is true for the young white women and young women of color, but that's not all. It sums up in that word security. The security moms, using that as a phrase, many of them were retreads just wealth women, married women who have a male income as well as their own income, who could feel secure in their daily life, but had been voting Republican for either religious reasons or for economic reasons for a long time. Who feels less secure in this society? People who have only one women's wage income or a income that is less that by and large people of color earn less than white people in this society. So I want to, my to put on my second hat is such way that into talking about the meaning of the word security. Bush was incredibly effective in narrowing the meaning of security. Narrow in, in an essence, beginning the end in terms of discourse as well as the slashing of social programs to the New Deal order that had given security the meaning of security was very different in the past. It was not reduced to national security, meaning just wartime issues in, in the most narrow military, a so-called war on terror, but economic security, the security of uh, living a decent life. So I want to end with bringing us back to another wartime president who had this expansive notion of security during World War II. Certainly, uh, if you want to use some of the current uh, rhetoric, good versus evil war, uh, a less problematic war in some ways, unless you happen to have been uh, Japanese-American in the US. But if we go back to uh, the State of the Un Union uh, message in January of 1944 by President Roosevelt, I just want to read you part of this because my, what I would tell, my advice to the Democratic Party in the vision thing is to redefine security. And that means, Roosevelt said, not only physical security, which provides safety from attacks by aggressors, it means also economic security, social security, moral security in a family of nations. And an equally basic essential to peace, permanent peace, is a decent standard of living for all individual men and women and children in all nations. Freedom from fear is eternally linked with freedom from want. Mm -hmm. Some would say that's the old message, but that's the message that did win dominance in American politics for, for many years. And Presumably, you think the Democrats didn't really convey that uh, or frame I, it that way. I think the notion of security was captured to a very narrow understanding mm -hmm. of foreign policy without the, the notion of the right to live a decent uh, life for all the people. Well, like any good um, professor, uh, professor Boris has introduced data into the conversation, and uh, Professor Applebaum, it being a, a perhaps data fanatic, maybe, um, has more data to share with us, I think, uh, about interpreting this. And, and that's been, you know, a lot of the press commentary on the election has referred to alleged 
pieces of data? What, what right, are and, and one piece of data I would like to introduce is that I'm also a professor of global and international studies here okay. at the record show. Um, Eileen uh, went back to uh, Roosevelt, uh, but I'd like to go back to Wilson, um, you know, almost a century ago, um, because uh, uh, Bush won this election uh, by the smallest margin of any re-elected president um, since that time. So I want to make two points. Um, one is that this uh, was not a mandate, and the other, to pick up on um, Eileen's comments, that, the, that uh, Kerry was much more in sync, and the Democrats are much more in sync with the way Americans think uh, than the Bush administration. Um, but the Bush administration did a better job of selling itself. I spent the last two weeks of the election season in Florida um, sort of sampling the many groups that turned out legions of volunteers. I worked with America Coming Together in Tampa as well as election protection, and I worked with the Kerry campaign and election protection in Naples, Collier County, which is very conservative. And I spent a lot of time in Immokalee. That's where I did a voter watching. Immokalee, mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know where it is, um, is sort of about 50 miles from the coast, um, from the west coast, southwest coast of Florida. It is a impoverished farm work area uh, with a large Haitian Creole population. And uh, one of the things I learned there was that the Haitians who voted in droves were overwhelmingly pro-democratic. The uh, white poll workers there said that's because they just don't know and they just kind of follow their instructions. But I talked to a lot of Haitian voters and why did they vote for the Democrats? Because during Republican administrations, they lost family members in Haiti under Papa Doc and Baby Doc. They knew that with Carter and Clinton, there was an opening. Um, by the way, my precinct went three to one for the Democrats, so I'm, that was good <laughs> news. But I expected... Incidentally, for those listening, perhaps you don't realize this is a biased panel with respect to preferences, I think, although we haven't actually found out the party registration or voting preferences of the panel. Anyone who, I mean, we didn't balance it with respect to political party preference, but we did try to get a diversity of angles and perspectives, and certainly we're not going to be uncritical of the Democrats tonight. Uh, thank you for, uh, yes, for that I comment. we needed Dick, to um, frame that, yeah. Uh, so let me make a couple of points. Um, the first point I want to make is uh, why did Kerry lose? Um, he did not lose for all the reasons which um, Democrats are flailing themselves for and which the media is presenting. I like to think of him as losing <clears throat> uh, by what I would call death by a thousand cuts. There were a thousand small factors, any one of which could have been different. Uh, to start with, if 9-11 hadn't happened, it would have been different. If union membership had been what it was in the 1950s, a third of the workforce, as opposed to 10 or 11 percent today, since the Democrats still carried the union vote heavily, including in Ohio, um, he wouldn't have lost. If <clears throat> the um, Republican attack machine had not been so effective, and they were extremely effective, um, the swift boat uh, Veterans for Truth ads, which we didn't see in California, but which ran constantly throughout the election season in the swing states, um, really did um, take a toll, a tremendous toll. Um, and, of course, there is Kerry, the candidate. Um, the exit polls and the subsequent polling all show that uh, most voters who voted for Kerry were not particularly excited about him. They were voting against Bush, whereas Bush's base was much more strongly uh, supportive of him. And while I happen to have come around to become a Kerry fan in the end, um, I thought he did not do a good job. Uh, in his campaign. Um, he came out way too late, I think, in staking his issues. He did not state a vision ever that certainly I could articulate. Um, and, um, well, let's see, the last um, president to be elected from Massachusetts was, of course, John Kennedy by a razor-thin margin. Um, you know, the last three Democrats to be elected uh, were Johnson, uh, um, Clinton, and Carter. Um, all from the South pretty much. So that does say something about sort of American political culture. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, finally, and I think this has to be said, uh, the Republican Party did a better job than the Democrats of getting out the vote. It all went under the radar pretty much, I think, because um, 
the work that the Democrats did and the 527s, those organizations such as Move On, um, America Coming Together and so on, um, <clears throat> with much fanfare, turned out a large number of volunteers. Um, and those volunteers were effective. They registered probably four or five million new voters, including, by the way, many new young voters. Uh, but the Republicans did the long march through the institutions, through the PTAs, through the churches, and so on and so forth. And um, ultimately, according to the figures I've seen, they did better. They registered something like six or seven million new voters for the election. Um, which um, brings me uh, to one question, the question of morals, which I know others will address, but I want to address it. I don't think this was a referendum on morals uh, by any stretch of the imagination. According to the statistics, um, the white uh, Christian evangelical vote in this country is um, something like, let me make sure I get the numbers um, straight, is 28% uh, of the vote. That's the white Christian evangelical, 28%. Um, because the black Christian Baptist vote tends to be democratic, the white Christian evangelical vote, 78% um, went to Bush and the rest went to Kerry. That means if you put those numbers together, less than one in five um, of the vote um, that went to Bush came from white Christian evangelicals. It also means that there's a large untapped uh, reservoir of white Christian evangelicals who voted uh, for Democrat, who voted for Kerry, um, and who could be voted, for, who could be pulled in, I believe, because of issues, um, which I'll say just very, just one or two words about. Um, this is something that uh, Karl Rove was aware of. He set a goal four years ago to address five million evangelicals uh, who were not registered to vote, and he was very successful in pulling them in. Um, <clears throat> one final comment on this. I was sort of struck at the asymmetry between what the Democrats are doing and their supporters and what the Republicans did. We were out there walking the streets in Tampa with voter lists that were often incorrect. And, you know, after hours of walking in the heat and the sun, we might identify half a dozen voters um, who hadn't made up their minds or who we could get to go to the polls. That is much less efficient than uh, working through churches and ministries and PTAs and so on and having the minister get up and say, uh, you know, I think that this person uh, is going to be good for us. So I'm not putting down what the Democrats did, but I think it's only half the side. Finally, let me just make a couple comments on the issues. Um, well, <clears throat> take any issue. Pro-choice. 55%, according to polls, of voters are pro-choice in one form or another. 21% think abortion should always be legal, and 34% think in most cases. 60% um, of uh, voters support some form of gay, lesbian relationship. 25% marriage, 35% civil union. Um, raising the minimum wage. This is a very interesting one. In Florida, um, ACORN, a grassroots group, had a minimum wage campaign on the bill to raise the minimum wage. It had the opposition of the Republican Party, of uh, the president's brother, the governor of Florida. It passed 72 to 28 percent, a huge margin. Uh, similar margins in Nevada. Obviously, this was an issue, and many people who voted to raise the minimum wage also voted uh, for President Bush. So, you know, on the issue, I think, something else. Um, uh, the Greenberg poll, which was done, um, uh, for 57 to 40 percent of American voters favor preserving the Social Security system as it is. 72 to 24 percent, a huge margin, uh, favor major reform of the health care system. Um, and dear to my own heart and my research, 58 to 33 percent of voters think that our trade agreements should be modified to contain protections for labor and the environment. So I really think that the Democrats have done a bad job of communicating their position. And my concluding remark is this. I think it is because they, and the Kerry campaign in particular, were way too timid on this. Kerry got into the fray late by going after uh, the war in Iraq, uh, but he never really hammered home populist issues, which I think would play to the Democratic base. And I think we want to get back in our general discussion to why that might have been the case, rather than just say, bad job, um, which I'm sure you want to explore further, too. But let's say bad job first. Mm -hmm. We did say bad yeah, job yeah. first. Yeah, often. Um, 72% just to, just to, of my brain wants to strangle the Democratic Party leadership. Uh, okay. But the rest is, is, is How does that have changed from... <laughs> um, just to, since I also am a data cruncher a little bit, and, and I thought I would uh, focus, since that's one of my interests, on the youth vote, and you brought that up, just let me piggyback on what you said, just, just to add a few more pieces of, 
a, a voter behavior to this. Uh, there's been some discussion about the youth vote. Before the election, a lot of the pro-Democrat interpreters of voting behavior said the polls are bound to undercount the youth vote because so many kids now use cell phones and don't have landlines. They're not even accessed by the polls. And indeed, post-election poll shows that about 20% of the 18 to 29-year-olds uh, have only cell phones, whereas the rest of the country age distribution, only about 7% do that. Uh, so there might have been a bit of an undercounting there. Um, as uh, the other point being ma uh, was that was made was that the youth turnout was going to be uh, such that it could outweigh uh, other, other constituencies and, and may even make a big difference. And that's an interesting uh, thing, just to, just to mention. The youth turnout was the highest, proportional to the 18 to 29-year-old population. Uh, the, the voter turnout of, of young people was the highest it's been since the 18-year-old vote was, was instituted. More than half of the 18 to 29-year-olds uh, did go to the polls. That's an unprecedented historic high. And in fact, the targets of the different youth mobilization groups were achieved in terms of the numbers who voted. This was the only age group that voted for Kerry. Um, uh, and uh, yet it didn't outweigh other groups because the voter turnout across the board was about the same, uh, the increase in voter turnout. So there wasn't a disproportionate turnout of youth compared to, to other age groups. So you can take it one way or the other. The youth vote failed to be a factor, or this was an amazing achievement. Uh, and from the point of view of someone who, who has studied youth, I think it was, if not amazing, a rather striking achievement. Uh, because the general tenor of youth culture in the past number of years seems to have been so apolitical and demobilized, some change may be happening as a consequence of this mobilization and some of the issues that the young people uh, supposedly were concerned with, including the draft as a kind of undercurrent uh, school costs of, of education, um, school budgets, and so on. But one of the things about the youth vote that hasn't been commented on is that it was much more a minority vote than any other age group. Mm -hmm. uh, there were, I think, something close to 10 percent more Latino uh, voters in the youth segment than in the general population. There was 5% more black voters. Uh, there were twice as many gay, self-identified gay voters um, as well in, in that youth group. So it, it looks like the targeting of youth um, really did impact particularly um, young people who had real grievances with the current administration in terms of race and sexuality, uh, for example. Uh, and that may account for the way their votes, uh, I don't have any data on comparing white youth vote compared to white older people's vote in terms of whether the white youth vote was more Democrat and more, and more carry than, than the older whites. Uh, so I, I, um, as you, as Eileen pointed out, race is a key factor in understanding how people um, uh, ended up race coupled with economic uh, issues in some com combination of, of factors. One last data point uh, that I want to make. Uh, there are three big constituencies the Democrats must um, achieve overwhelming support from in order to win a national election. Eileen talked about women, but there was a slippage in, yeah. in women's support yeah. of the Democrats. Uh, and I think even in the category of single women, there might have been some slippage, but I'm not sure of that. Mm -hmm. We can comment on that. Yeah, but everyone's commented on the slippage in the, in the Latino um, support for the Democrats. And there's an obvious discussion. Is this a long-term shift? Uh, majority of Latinos voted Democrat, but uh, something like an 8 or 9% shift happened there. Even among African Americans, there was a... Uh, small but probably conceivably significant shift in a state like uh, Florida. Uh, so those are the th those are reasons for Democrats to be very concerned just on a purely practical electoral strategy uh, level. Why, if they were so uh, mobilized uh, on the ground campaign that, that you referred to, uh, did these su such a significant number of people in these constituencies um, shift toward or continue to support 
the incumbent president. There are different ways to look at it. So that's going to hang over us as, as we uh, continue to go around the table. Um, Lisa, your, your focus is on media, and uh, you, I, I know you want to say some things about that. Yeah. Um, what was missing in the campaign, in my opinion, was um, a lack of discussion of media industry re reform, um, which is really surprising given all the ammunition on the Democratic side to address such issues. Um, just to mention a few of them, uh, there's the continual selling off of the electromagnetic spectrum under Michael Powell, Powell's leadership of the FCC, the loosening or elimination of laws that restrict media ownership, the erosion of First Amendment rights, the refusal to take seriously the legal mandate to operate and regulate the airwaves in the public interest. Um, the Center for Digital Democracy calls this FCC's policy uh, quote, leave no media monopoly behind policy, or a kind of ongoing big giveaway. Um, and if there's not some intervention in these kinds of uh, issues soon, in, in the issues of media reform, those who rely on the internet for news and information can really anticipate surfing a, an increasingly corporatized cyberspace. Um, last year, in June and July, the FCC uh, gave away so much spectrum that experts in the field predicted that this would have become a key campaign issue, but it didn't. Um, instead, what we see is an FCC that is more concerned about moral policing than ensuring citizens receive adequate information to become educated at, at the, the voting polls. Um, this is manifest, for instance, in the way that Janet Jackson's breast became more interesting to the FCC than television networks coverage of the presidential campaigns. The FCC fined CBS uh, $550,000 for what Michael Powell called the Super Bowl Burlesque, burlesque show, um, but networks' failure to adequately explain and differentiate the many candidates' platforms or deliver thorough reporting about the war in Iraq goes unnoticed by this FCC. And if we want to continue to call this country a de democratic society, we need to focus more on this issue of media reform and insist that our, elec our elected officials begin to treat the spectrum as public property. Um, I probably don't have to remind people, but the Communication Acts of 1927 and 1934 um, define the airwaves as a, as a public resource, as public property, not unlike the way that the oceans and the forests in this country are, are treated under the law as such. Um, so. Uh, you know, and while there is great reason to be highly critical of TV news, many intellectuals and liberals um, and leftists never watch commercial TV. Most of their critiques are based on the assumption that the commercial ownership of broadcasting broadcasting necessarily reproduces in its content the ideologies of corporate and political elites. And while this indeed may, may be true, and, and most of us might agree that that's true, it's way too simple a way to treat a, a medium whose history is, uh, whose history uses and viewers are so complex. Um, so I think because of this, media literacy and education are more important than ever, but this also involves a commitment, a commitment to watch commercial television, to track and critique the, its contradictory paths of knowledge production. So we could think, for example, and I want to use this um, kind of, might seem like a strange example, but Howard Dean's scream um, after the results of the Iowa caucuses came in in January 2004, because I think this moment tells us a lot about how the TV industry works. The screen became extremely lucrative for the commercial television news networks. So enthralled by its entertainment value, the broadcast and cable networks played the screen 633 times in the four days after Dean's speech. They took it out of its context, they isolated it as a brief clip, manipulated the volume, and used it to lampoon Dean and question his competency as a presidential candidate, in effect sabotaging the, the campaign by referring referring to him as angry, too temperamental, out of control, inappropriate, unpresidential, and so on. Um, T, you know, we should know, we should remember that TV news content is restricted to certain time slots. Segments will always be interpreted in relation to what precedes and follows them, and some things will always be emphasized over others. And Dean's voice was cut down to a soundbite, played after other candidates who were shown speaking calmly, Edwards was one of them, and accentuated because the microphone he used separated the scream from ambient noise, making it sound much louder than it was 
actually heard in that room. Um, so, um, you know, Dean's scream also ended up taking a, on a life of its own online as websites sprouted up around the, you know, around the web to correct what the TV networks got wrong. And I would say with the exception of ABC's Diane Sawyer, who did her own detailed investigation of how the scream played on television. This, you know, scream was also sampled in hip hop songs, imitated on the late night TV talk shows, and labeled I ha the I Have a Scream speech. <laughs> Perhaps more important, though, was the way that this media event revealed something about the perverse political age in which we live. Why would we be so offended by Dean's scream and not offended by Bush's uh, alleged use of an earpiece during the debates? Why would we be offended, uh, you know, by the passion of a political candidate and not be offended by an administration that authorizes the torture of prisoners in Abu Ghraib or the ongoing attacks of Iraqis in Fallujah? 1,200 have been, a ki have been killed, apparently, in this past week alone. We can only imagine the screams that must reverberate there because they actually never make it to our TV screens. What's wrong? What, I don't understand, looking back at the Dean scream, what was wrong with a political a presidential candidate exuberantly expressing himself before a crowd of cheering supporters? Our current president made a really loud scream. It was an illegal declaration of war. Give me, personally, as a, as a, as a citizen of this country, give me Dean's scream over Bush's war cry any day. <laughs> but what this event also revealed, and I'll wrap up here, Unfortunately, it was a lack of vision and verve within the Democratic Party, within the leadership of the Democratic Party, which treated it as an opportunity to edge Dean out of the race and scold him for being out of party line. Some even withdrew their endorsements, and the irony, of course, is that Dean may now be in contention for the position of chair of the DNC, precisely because he was one of the only candidates that had a platform based on substantive and meaningful differences from the Republican Party. Another irony, for me, is that Dean was one of the only candidates who took, took a position on media reform, boldly stating, quote, this government has given away our airwaves to the most powerful corporations who are misleading the public. That is a dangerous thing for the promulgation of democracy, and that will be undone in a Dean administration." End of quote. So the Dean scream is much more than just a wild howl. It's a symptom of, one, the need to invigorate the Democratic Party with meaningful differences rather than centrist stances. Two, the commitment to First Amendment rights, which includes the right to be outraged over the current administration's policies. And three, the need for media industry reforms that treat the airwaves as a public resource instead of a corporate or military battlefield. So that's, those are some things that I wanted okay, to well say. That's, that's <laughs> very fresh. <laughs> I haven't heard that on the media. As it <laughs> <laughs> and Professor Newfield, Chris Newfield, you have some um, sharp observations, well, perhaps. Well, I, I just something that Lisa said, I think that it was the Dean's squeak that cost him it. Because if he had roared like a fuller-bodied man, I think he would have done better. <laughs> but there was, it, to me, to my ear, it sounded like somebody who doesn't go to that many football games and doesn't really know how to do the whole throat Roar. So anyway, that's a. You might um, give us a demonstration. <laughs> no, because I would sound just like Howard Dean. So is it really all down to? I being believe you. I know what I'm talking about on that thing. Dean really sounds. You may be more. Yeah. Yeah. It is all. You may be more yeah. feet than Dean, so don't. <laughs> I think a lot of um, of what happened here was the the politics of masculinity in the sense that the person who gets to be president is always the person who's the biggest American and the biggest man, and that's a lot of what this was about this election, and we can, we can cycle back to that. But um, I think that it's important to focus also on what a total disaster this was for the Democrats and for so-called blue America. There is not a mainstream in the United States. There are two mainstreams, and they're fundament fundamentally divided, and one of them really lost big. The blue state, so-called, or blue county, or blue precinct, or democratic side, lost all three branches of government 
um, it's going to probably lose uh, various um, federal legal decisions that depend upon this, the Supreme Court having some kind of balance, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing I think to bear in mind is that we have the same conversation every four years. We've been having it since I was old enough to vote. The first time I voted, I voted for Jimmy Carter, and I've been voting for one centrist, not very good Democratic presidential candidate after another my entire adult life, and Kerry is only the last in a long line of these guys. The, um, the exception that is the person that actually won was Bill Clinton, but bear in mind that Clinton only got in the sort of the high 30s of the popular vote the first time around, in the low 40s. He didn't get a plurality, anything like the one that George Bush just got um, a couple of weeks ago. So what we have is actually a, a Democratic Party that has not gotten, with possibly one exception, no, with no exceptions, a uh, majority of the popular vote since 1972 when they started doing um, these kinds of, of exit polls. It has never gotten anything close to a majority of white folks. There's an enormous racial divide as Eileen um, suggested. So my, my conclusion from this is throw out this entire strategy of bridge building to moderates and to fence sitters. It has failed this year, it failed four years before, eight years before, twelve years before. It has never succeeded. In the press for the last month there were constant reports about how Bush was deciding to go to his base. That's what he did and he won. So my view is that the Democrats are only going to succeed on the national level if they go to their base, and they're only going to succeed on the national level if they start going to their base on the local level as well. Um, I, I think this includes, or going, what I mean by going to the base, it would involve a couple of, of really crucial things. The first is holding the Bush administration and the people that voted for him, our beloved Republicans on the other side, accountable for the policies that they actually did vote for. There is no evidence other than speculation among both liberals and conservatives in the media that the, the working class was duped into voting for Bush. This is a theory. There is no actual evidence for this. People voted for what Bush had already given them. He had a track record this time. And he got more votes with his track record than he did before. They voted for preemptive war. They voted for a war on terror. They voted for the downsizing of Social Security. They voted for um, global warming and weaker environmental protections. They voted for greater economic inequality. They voted for downsizing and outsourcing in terms of um, the you know, traditional American industries. Well, I think that we have to... You're, you're saying they voted for these things consciously or they voted for these things uh, because I think that's many, who they there's elected. no evidence that they did not vote for well, them the evidence was, yeah. was Rich Applebaum. Actually, there data. is. Can I just give yeah. you some evidence? Uh -huh. Please. Um, you know, the University of America, Maryland does mm -hmm. these surveys periodically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they published one October 21st called The Separate Realities of Bush and Kerry Supporters. This mm -hmm. is the program on international policy mm -hmm. attitudes. So let me just read you a summary here. A large majority of Bush supporters believe that before the Iraq, the war, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction or a major program for building them. A substantial majority of Bush supporters assumed that most experts believe Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. And this was the conclusion of the recently released report by Charles Dulfer. A large majority of Bush supporters believe that Iraq was providing substantial support to Al-Qaeda and that clear evidence had been found. And a large majority of Bush supporters also believe that the decision to go to war had strong support among our allies throughout the world. I mean, I, you know, I do think that uh, most people, um, and I, I won't make the strong statement, as going to, many people simply do not track this. Mm -hmm. They get their information from Fox News on television if they get it there, or they get it from the ads that were run in the swing states. Mm -hmm. And I would not, you know, I would not conclude that the fact that Bush got a majority of the vote and a majority of the electoral vote means that the people who voted for him voted for him because they agree with his policies on these things. I, I mean, think, there, you know, where this is the culture of responsibility. People have to be responsible for the person that they vote for and the policies that he has announced as his policies that he has already put in place for the four years that he was in power and that he's promised to put in place in the four, for the next four years. But it's a standard trick in American politics which Bush has played to the hilt, it's both, both parties have done, which is to immediately try to implement an agenda 
when in office, when in power. That is not the agenda that their base or uh, large numbers mm -hmm. of people expected them to implement. I, if yeah. You're right, on, to mm -hmm. my mind, on this, that the people who voted for Bush, many of them do want that social quote, values program, many of them do. That doesn't mean that's why he won. I'm not talking that, about social values only. I know, but that's not, I don't think people, the, the polls have, there's, there's every evidence that people don't want privatization of Social Security, that they do want a national health plan. So the, the thing to be perplexed about is why, wanting those things, they would vote for Bush. I think uh, there's, let me just finish this, I yeah. really want to say something. I, I mean, I think what Rich is pointing to is something that's important. It has to do with the information divide that's the, the root yeah. of the culture divide. And it's connected to what Lisa was saying about, that's right. about the way that the media plays out. If you, I would love to see a study that shows, uh, correlates votes to media markets, because my sense is the less diverse media markets produce more conservative voting. That's just my assumption, and I would like to see whether that's true or not. I to show that people who get their news from The Daily Show are more, <laughs> a little, are more factually informed. They get the facts, questions uh -huh. on the facts, more correct than people who watch Fox News. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very interesting. But I, I think a large number of people don't follow the news, period. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but I, but I wanna, including a huge proportion of the students at this university. My belief is that the people that don't know that there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and don't know that Al-Qaeda and Hussein were not working hand in hand, don't want to. Right. Faith, they, they, yes, rather they, than fact. It is a form of sanctioned ignorance that they should not be let off the hook for. And I mean, I, 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 go ahead, I, I'll say later what I think <laughs> that involves. Him. Okay, I'd really like to hear <laughs> what you have to say. I want to I wanna make... Uh, two points if I remember both of them, but let me, let me, let me just um, make one. It's not that, I don't think people are necessarily duped. There is still what's called the American dream. And so that's why s some Latinos and Latinas, some African Americans, Bush is, they, and many poor people, they want us, they want to see themselves not as perpetually in this place, and they accept the inequality, people accept the inequalities of American societies as long as they think they too can become part of Bush's notion of the ownership society. This was, you know, Gingrich before had the opportunity society. Uh, but Americans also believe in something called fairness. Uh, in, in these sort of national mythologies, at least they like to think they do. And, and so the question is to what extent do these populist notions of what's fair and what isn't fair, and what's fair for whom, because there's also the notion of people see what's fair to them but not fair for the other guy who's getting affirmative action, the other guy who's getting la government largesse, but that's been used for, it's almost like a reverse populism. It's the attacks on programs for people and below mm -hmm. rather than the people above. Now, is it possible to take these notions of fairness and of aspirations and give them a um, populist twist against those above rather than the resentment to those below. Um, let me interject here because this is another piece of, of evidence with respect to what Chris was saying. Stanley Greenberg is, I think, the most astute Democratic Party-oriented pollster. You referred to the fact that he's done... He wrote a book right. a few months ago called The Two Americas, very much... Uh, like the kind of thing that you were saying to two different streams mm -hmm. and he said both parties are 50 percent parties so both have to have a combination of mobilizing their base but also bridging but his advice about the democrats bridging was not what carried it his advice six months ago was more like what eileen is getting at he called it the corporate frame the democrats have to have to articulate the threat of corporate domination and their p programs or, 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 or methods of challenging that. If they hope to reach rural voters, uh, the kinds of working class voters, white voters who are going to support Bush, all things being equal. So one construction that I've come to of this of this uh, result of this election is on the whole large numbers of people are, are prepared to support the incumbent especially in wartime 
Uh, it is more secure in feeling that we can trust the president than not. Propaganda against Bush, which so much affects us, attacks on Bush, dis disrupts that sense of safety that a lot of people want to preserve, delusory or not. The Democrats have to give a reason for change that went beyond simply get rid of Bush because of all the, the bad stuff that he did. And that's, the, to me, the failure, of, uh, the, the reasons for change which Greenberg advises should be about how Bush is selling the country to um, the, corporate the corporate few, a populist campaign, but with that kind of analysis having to do with media, having to do with uh, not just the drug companies, which he alluded to, but, but all the of the, yes, and the, the environmental right. depredations and so forth. Would but that have made more. a difference? According to Greenberg, how does he know that it would make a difference? Well, he doesn't know. But he presented, <laughs> but... Well, then why are we hearing about because it? Because a few months polls. ago, he <laughs> presented in polls a, two vision statements to, to people, a, a anti-corporate vision statement and a free market statement. And, you know, 55, 60% of people preferred the anti-corporate model yes. to the free market model. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that he's been trying and others like him to promote. With them. Why don't the Democrats pick up on that is one question we could discuss. Because they're also a corporate but, but, party, uh, perhaps. Having, having attacked you, uh, your, your view, or, or challenged it so I much. I feel very unattacked, actually. Oh, good, okay. Way too nice. That's good. Um, <laughs> I, let me be the divider, not the united. All right. The, um, <laughs> although you know it's totally out of person character for me. I, I think that... Um, the, there's a crucial issue that connects to all of these things that you're talking about. It's true. A majority of people in focus groups and in polls suspect corporate power and want an alternative to that. Why don't they vote that way? Well, it's partly because the Democrats are terrible at articulating that they don't have an alternative vision. My feeling about them is that the leadership has become corrupt around campaign money to the point where they know that they get paid either way, win or lose. They get a third if they lose, they get 40% if they win. That's about the same ratio year in, year out. So on some level it doesn't really matter. And I haven't noticed a big purge of the mm -hmm. upper leadership in the wake of their you know, latest repeated failure. But the, the thing that I think is really crucial to think about is the, the, the question of the American attitudes towards the use of force to resolve conflicts. And I mean by that military force abroad, the Kerry-Bush vote split absolutely on that question around Iraq through the, the Iraq exit polling. Uh, the, and a prohibitionist uh, domestic policy at home for solving various problems, whether it's gay people wanting to make commitments to each other, right. um, whether it has to do with reproductive choice, or any of the other moral values issues that we've talked about. And it, it connects up to the economic issue around the question of concentrated economic power. If people don't feel like they have the right to ask for some kind of participatory or democratic or whatever words you want to use, input into the way that their economies look and the way that their communities are being built, they're not going to vote for somebody who just signals that he's less corporate than the other right. person. Okay. And we haven't connected That's in very the Democratic Party point. all of those issues around coercion. You can't and just signal yeah. that you're anti-corporate. You have to yeah. prove to people that you're strong enough to oppose the corporations because mm -hmm. most people have internalized what the left was arguing for years. The corporations are very powerful. You mm -hmm. can't really challenge their power. Right. The po Greenberg poll after the election showed that 45 percent of people believe that Bush favors corporations rather than ordinary people. Mm -hmm. uh, something, some, including a large proportion of his voters. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, if you think corporate power is inevitable, mm -hmm. then you're going to live within that, that mm -hmm. uh, framework. And, and it gets back to whether you feel like you have any control over your life. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't feel you have control over your life, and if you're looking for some, I mean, our schooling system, everything doesn't teach people mm -hmm. to, to really participate. Especially working class. Well, it Especially doesn't teach us to demand now, that because right. we mostly tell them they're not going to have it. Right. Anyway, so why so, waste your life fighting for something you mm -hmm. don't want to jump in? Go ahead. You're taking notes, did we? No, just I, I <laughs> do want to connect this fatalism about the control that corporations have over our society and culture to the way that people have a sort of helplessness mm -hmm. about media mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. their ability to 
get accurate information, especially from the commercial mass mm -hmm. media. Um, and that's why it's so important that we need to educate students in the UC system about media influence, about the structure of media, so that they become more savvy consumers and they start to ask questions. I also think it's great that on our campus, you know, students can intern at KCSB radio station mm -hmm. and actually take on the challenge of writing a news report for themselves mm -hmm. and see how difficult it is to accurately represent an issue from a variety of perspectives. Um, so just but let me ask you, um, however, about the rise of the, of the Internet as an alternative channel of communication. I mean, there are web blog sites. Daily Cause comes to mind. I was going there every day during the campaign. Something like half a million people daily right. were consulting that one site. And these bloggers had a big effect when that whole um, D Dan Rather controversy mm -hmm. broke up. The right wing broke out. The right wing bloggers were big on that. Now there's this tremendous, intense, uh, as we're speaking now, uh, blog interest in whether you know there was fraud in the election and, and so forth. H how do you, as a media analyst, evaluate that channel compared to the corporate-dominated? Um, well, I think it's really important to have a relational understanding between these media systems. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you know, look at moveon.org, right. who, this is an organization that figured out a way to sort of permeate commercial television channels by soliciting donations so that people could mm -hmm. pr purchase ads on CNN. And, um, and so there, there's a relationship between the internet and television. They're not sep they are separate mm -hmm. technological systems, but increasingly they're converging. And we need to teach people about how things travel across them. And, you know, the Drudge Report in many cases will set the agendas that end up popping up either on CNN or Fox News. So we just need models of analysis that allow us to track the movement of information across these systems. And is there a danger of corporate in, in invasion of the blogosphere and, 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 <laughs> and related seemingly freer spaces? Is there a danger that that can be captured by, by uh, corporate control? Well, if the bandwidth keeps being uh, parceled off by the FCC, these bl the blogosphere you know, is in, in jeopardy, mm -hmm. in a sense. And, um, you know, blog, there's a lot of research being done on blogs now, and some of it ranges from, you know, arguing that this is a great expression of individualism within the information uh, space, but some say that blogs are nothing more than echo chambers, and that people are basically talking in these very small circles, and that, that those dialogues don't necessarily get out in, in a way that they might if they had broader distribution on uh, television. I, I want to reinforce that last comment. Um, I don't know what the research shows, but I would suspect that it shows that people uh, generally reinforce their own thinking uh, by hooking up to the Internet. But nonetheless, it's clear that in this election it had a huge effect. Enormous sums of money were raised, for example, on both sides. Uh, when the Sinclair was going to run the anti-carry infomercial hour-long program, that was pretty much derailed uh, by a movement that was mobilized. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I just I want to say something <clears throat> a little more optimistic, I think, than what's uh, what's been said. I mean, and this the voter turnout in this election was the highest in years. Um, it's not as high as in other um, country democracies, uh, but it's it was good. Uh, uh, people were mobilized this time. Uh, the Republicans, as I said initially, did a better job of mobilizing their base. Um, I think um, a big problem for the Democrats, just to build on what you were saying, Chris, is that they haven't really articulated any kind of a vision, no. or a hopeful vision. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can only get so far, especially in our political culture, which sort of worships the uh, uh, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick, John yeah. Wayne, Ronald Reagan, George Bush persona. The cop. Um, right. By um, we can do being it on critical. our principles. You know, Pardon? there were there were the ones that Eileen mentioned before. We have principles. It should be a strong anti-war policy, right. short of genocide and short of immediate threats. The United States does not solve conflicts with other countries by invading them. So right, and, and these are economics that so I we think rebuild the workforce right. with a set of strategies. But this campaign went for those 
who could they have been undecided voters? Yeah, right. The Democrats, <laughs> right. the, the Republicans were mobilizing their base. Yeah, the right. Democrats went for the undecided, and that was the wrong strategy. They should have gone right. four years ago for the non-voters, for the 40% or whatever of the electorate yes. that still doesn't yeah. vote because that is their natural constituency mm -hmm. would I, respond I, to I, a populist message. I have one message. cautionary note to the Democrats. When people are talking about, let's, let's get the evangelical tradition, I mean, history shows us, yes, evangelicals have not always voted on the right. I mean, they have been abolitionists, and uh, they actually have voted economic populism, but almost inevitably, they have been for the patriarchal family. And it's re so I, I'm a little nervous that as people began to, again, the Democrats began going, let's go to where this sort of center is, that certain key constituencies and key freedoms key fairnesses are neglected in the name of let's get moral values. That's not the center, that's the right. I agree, but I think the center yeah. has become the right. So the right has become mm -hmm. the center. Well, we're meet, reaching the end of our, of our allotted time. Uh, we've been stimulated, I hope, uh, and perhaps those watching as well. Uh, I would add one thing, and since we're running out of time, no one can contradict me on this. Um, that that to, to bound a discussion of vision and, and, and values and political perspectives by what political parties can articulate is probably a dead end. And that those of us who are free enough in our time, space, energy, and so forth to begin that articulation, we, we shouldn't just be focused on what the parties say because they are inevitably even corrupt. Uh, so much as what we can uh, put out and what uh, we can encourage to be debated that is so constrained now by, by the kind of media framework that Lisa's been talking about and by the kind of political uh, uh, strategy making rather than, than uh, deeper uh, articulation that, that the uh, political parties are engaged in. So I want to thank um, all of you for uh, sharing. Uh, your views now and uh, hopefully uh, stimulating uh, that kind of public discussion that, that the country so badly needs.